I'm just looking you over, is that all right? <laughs> Praise the Lord. It is, it's, it's good to be here in the river that falls. Why is it called Fall River? What is that? Okay. <laughs> Nothing else falls, I trust. We're rising, right, in, in newness of life and the strength of God. Thank God that we've uh, just celebrated resurrection. Amen. And we are understanding that resurrection is not just something to believe in, but it's actually something to participate in. Yeah, for a long time, I think many people of the, of the kingdom have embraced the finished work of the cross. Thank God for the finished work of the cross. But thank God for the work of the empty tomb. He is not here. He's risen. Remember? He's risen as he said. But you see, many people in the church have had resurrection belief. But they haven't had resurrection behavior. Yes. God help us not only to believe in the resurrection, but if we really believe in the resurrection, then we understand that the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead can quicken our mortal bodies. And no matter what the doctor says, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the scenario is, we believe not only in the resurrection, we believe in resurrection. And when you say we're down, we're out, we rise again, because the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead causes us to get up again, and get up again, and get up again. So now, now we're into resurrection behavior. Because he rose, we keep rising also. Praise the Lord. So it's good to be here and to see your smiling faces. I'm a man of faith, so I said to see your smiling faces. <laughs> Only about six of you were smiling, so I, I'm, I'm warming up to see if I can win some, some rapport here. But thank God for His grace in our lives. Yes. We thank God for uh, Barnabas Ministries that um, this church has stood behind for so many years and we're still going strong in the name of the Lord. Praise God. We had a team in Uganda in, in January. Next month, uh, my wife and I will be in Burundi along with a, a team of, of other pastors, a place called Bujumbura. I don't know if you ever heard of that. <laughs> and another place called Katega, but we will be there. And then later on, um, we have two teams in Kenya, and then in the western part and the eastern uh, part of Kenya. I think Pastor's been to both those places, right? Yes. So that still goes on. And then later on, we'll be in Zimbabwe and then South Africa. And then in October, we'll be in India. And Probably we'll finish the year in Puerto Rico and then the new year will be here again. But uh, the teams are going also, I, I forgot to mention, we also have a team in going to Ghana in, I think it's in October. So praise God, the teaching teams are still going out, strengthening the brethren. And uh, when I was there in India, I, I might have shared with you before, but uh, there were 1,500 pastors there, and I had the privilege of, of addressing them. And I said to them, you're in, you're in India to save, you're in ministry in India to save souls. I'm in ministry in India to save ministries. Because that's the object to keep men and women off the casualty list to strengthen the brethren and to impart to them and to instill in them safety valves so that the enemy doesn't take advantage and they keep rising and go strong in the things of God. So praise God, the work is still going forward. Hallelujah. And maybe if you might even think of it, uh, next month we'll be in that funny name place, Bujumbura, 
maybe you think God bless uh, the ministry there through Barnabas Ministries and Bujumbira. We'd, we'd help. We would be pleased if you could participate with us in a prayer ministry, because uh, Burundi is a country that has had a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulties, and things are, are not very stable there. But that doesn't stop us from going and lifting up a standard against the enemy. Amen? Amen? So it's good to be here. Are you relaxed? Are you? Are you do I need to pray again so that you... <laughs> Father, thank you for your word. You've magnified your, your word even above your name. Please, Lord, one more time. Let that which is shared be spirit. Let it be life. Let your name be glorified. Let the fruitfulness of yourself spring forth. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to speak to you uh, on this subject. The fearful becomes fearless. The fearful becomes fearless. I guess you could call this the tale of two Peters. Okay, today let's think about a man who conquered fear. If you glance at Matthew 14 and verse 30, you will read just this line. When he, that's Peter, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. That's Peter number one. Okay? Then if you fast forward to Acts 4, verse 13, it says, when he, speaking of Peter again, or excuse me, when they saw the boldness of Peter, they marveled. That's Peter number two. Almost seems like two different Peters, but the one becomes the other, you understand. But when we first read about him in, in Matthew 14, it says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. He was nervous in the service. But later on in Acts 4.13, it says, when they saw, that's the high council in Jerusalem, when they saw the boldness of Peter, it's a different Peter now, it seems like they became afraid. So, in the early church, we don't read anything about their resolutions, just the Acts. Come on, there's a book called the Acts. One of the main characters of the book of Acts is Peter. He's often referred to as the big fisherman. He dominates the first part of the book of Acts just as Paul dominates the second part. Peter is one whose life and ministry teaches us very, very much. But today, let's think of him from the perspective of his fears. The reason for that is fear is a powerful force. Fear can be a powerful factor in all of our lives. If you have never been afraid, it's because you are not a human. You are from Mars. You are an extraterrestrial being. And I would like to meet you after the service because I've never met anybody from outer space yet. All humans have encountered fear. But fear is detrimental to us because fear is faith working in the wrong direction. It's believing for what you don't want. It's believing for the negative. Whether you think in Portuguese or you think in English, it doesn't make any sense to believe for what you don't want. Right? That's really what fear is. It's, it's like you put your, your life in reverse and you're believing for the wrong things. It would make no sense for you to get in a vehicle 
and put your vehicle in reverse and drive from here to Boston, I think you may not make the journey. It would not be a good idea. But often in our lives, we put them in reverse because we're believing for the negative, we're believing for the wrong things. And there's lots of people that help us with that. You know, the weatherman helps us with that. Uh, the news reports help us with that. We're discipled with all kinds of fears all the time. And uh, we have to be careful that the main focus from our life is not fear, but faith. Amen. I got some amens. Amen. Praise God. Amen. So uh, fear can be a powerful factor in our lives. For fear can cause us, not anybody in Fall River, but fear can cause us to become neurotic. It can cause us to become obsessive. Fear can cause us to become compulsive. This is a study of other people in other states, not Massachusetts. But fear can cause us to become neurotic. Obsessive, compulsive, and fear affects our conduct. It limits our involvement in the kingdom of God. You could say that fear paralyzes us. I believe it should be said that it's fear that keeps you from your new season in God. Come on now. It keeps you from becoming all that Jesus says you can become. So fear can cause us to become some things. Uh, fear affects our conduct. But fear also creates in us the development of phobias. Now I know in Massachusetts this is not the condition. I'm just talking about people from Arizona or New Mexico or California. You know, in many, many quarters we become a, a phobia-oriented society. Phobia is an aversion to or a strong fear of. Now, these list here that I'm going to share with you is not for your edification, it's just for your information. But uh, there are some people who have claustrophobia, fear of closeness. There are others who have acrophobia, fear of heights. And then there's zoophobia, fear of animals. And then there's phrygophobia, fear of the cold. And there's misophobia, fear of dirt. And there's pathophobia, fear of disease. And there's panophobia, fear of everything. <laughs> and there's aerophobia, fear of flying. And astrophobia, fear of lightning. And polyphobia, fear of many things. And Kleptophobia, fear of stealing, and hydrophobia, fear of water, and phobophobia, which is fear of fear. <laughs> and maybe this is one in the church, neophobia, fear of anything new. <laughs> and then there's, this wouldn't apply to you, just to me, but there's chronophobia, fear of time or growing old. And there's Triskaidphobia, that's fear of number 13, in case you're interested in that. There's still many, many, many more that we could list, but we become a, a phobia-oriented society. But never mind us, this is about Peter. And Peter had many phobias. So carefully, let us look at the life of the big fisherman, Peter, to see the effects of fear. Initially, Jesus said to his disciples, well, four of them in particular, if you remember in Mark 1.17, he said, follow me and I will make you to become. I know the rest of the statement, but I want to focus on becoming. Because Jesus says, if you follow me, I'll make you to become. The suggestion is, You'll become what you could never become. It's by winning the lottery, by all the education in the world, by a change of environment, or any other circumstance. 
follow me and I will make you to become. When you follow Jesus, he makes you to become what you couldn't become through any other means. Even if you don't say amen, it's still true. Now when he said to his disciples, follow me, he didn't just mean for them to physically follow him around the countryside. To follow him, to be impressed by his messages that he might share, or the miracles that he might perform. No, he meant for them to follow him experientially. Not just to follow in his footsteps, but follow in his lifestyle. In other words, he was saying to them, if you do what I do, then you will do what I do. Amen. Come on now. If you become what I am, then you will be able to be all that you see radiating from my life and expressed from my life. So really, Jesus was saying to his disciples, if you follow me, you're going to be in a special school of training. And in this special school of training, I will stretch you and strengthen you and stretch you and strengthen you. And even though I only got one hallelujah, Jesus is saying to you today, I'm going to stretch you and strengthen you and stretch you and strengthen you to bring you to new capacities of competency, but also new strengths to be what you couldn't be through any other means. Now Peter, his life was negatively affected by many things. Whose life has not been negatively affected by many things? His life was negatively affected by so many things which made him a failure in the area of courage. So that's basically what I'm going to talk to you about. This is not about you. Relax. Take it easy. This is a study about Pete, who was a failure of courage. Matthew 14, I referred to earlier, focuses on Peter and his overriding fears. I'll read a verse or two out of that 14th chapter of Matthew. Verse 25 says, And in the fourth watch of the night. Jesus came to them walking on the water. I mean, are you seeing this? It's the fourth watch of the night. They're in the boat out on the Sea of Galilee and Jesus came to them walking on the water. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, it is a ghost. And they cried out for fear. I wonder what you would have done in that situation. Maybe you might have had a similar response. But when they were terrified and they cried out for fear, Jesus spoke. He said, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. I'm hoping in your stormy sea, in your troubled situation, you might hear the voice of Jesus saying, do not be afraid, it is I. Now, Peter, you've got to understand the personality of Peter. He was one who would often do things without thinking. And without thinking, Peter responded when the Lord says, Take heart, it is I, have no fear. Peter doesn't even think. He says, Lord, if it's you, bid me come walk on the water. Now, Jesus knew enough not to give Peter a chance to think. So he simply said, come. And without thinking, Peter steps out of the boat and he walked on the water heading to Jesus. Now come on, somebody ought to say, wow, can you see this? I mean, he didn't even think. The Lord said, come, and he steps out on, onto the water, 
and walks on the water heading towards Jesus. I think that deserves a wow. I mean, wow. But the scripture says, when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And fear can cause you to sink. And as he was sinking, he cried out to Jesus. I suggest when you're sinking, you cry out to Jesus. And what happened? Jesus caught him by the hand and said, O oh man of little faith, why did you doubt? So together we're sharing. Let's call this the fear of sinking. The fear of sinking. He started out by stepping out on Jesus' word, come. How many of you know you can step out on Jesus' word, come? Amen. Come unto me, all you that labor, heavy laden. In, in light of the resurrection, come see the place. Jesus is often saying, come. And when you respond to his come, miracles can happen in your life, in your situation. He started by stepping out on Jesus' word, come. But then he took his eyes off Jesus and on the threatening circumstances. How often is our focus on the circumstances instead of on the Christ? This can result in the fear of sinking, causing us to panic, causing us to be overwhelmed with discouragement. The fear of sinking can cause anybody to panic. Do you know, negative circumstances can be the measure of your courage. I know you missed that one. Come on now. It's good for you to have neg negative circumstances because they are a barometer or a measure of how much courage you have. And we must be, in these days in which we live, men and women of courage. Now, you're looking at me like I'm from Japan or China or somewhere, I don't know. But uh, I had been a professor for a number of years and taught classes. And I recently taught a class, a 10 week course, and it was a course entitled Living Victoriously. But I told my class that this is, this is not really a class, this is a clinic. And I'm the doctor. You're the patient. I don't care which arm you take your shot. I'm going to administer to you your faith booster today. So roll up your sleeve, left arm or right arm, doesn't matter to me. You're getting your faith booster. And I shared with them, and I took out a little box that said B12 on it. So I said, I'm giving you your B12 shot. The Bible says, be strong, be courageous. I had 12 of them with scriptures. You don't pray about this, you don't wait on this, this you're not for a certain time. You be strong, you be courageous. And maybe that's a good word for somebody here today. I don't know about the circumstances or anything that you're going through or you're facing, but the Lord said to a man overwhelmed by his circumstances, which was Joshua, be strong, be courageous. As a matter of fact, it says four times in that same first chapter of Joshua, be, be. So here's your shot for today. Your, this is your faith booster. No matter how you feel, no matter what you look like, no matter what you're facing, no matter what about what, be strong, Hallelujah. be courageous. Be courageous. Uh, maybe I'm not jabbing it in hard enough, you know. I, I once went through some procedures uh, a few years ago where they uh, put long needles into my legs and the doctor said, this will hurt. He was right. <laughs> uh, this should hurt a little bit. Be courageous. Yes. Did I, did I push it in hard enough? Be courageous. 
God is calling for you to be strong, to be courageous today. So the circumstances, the negative circumstances, can actually be a measure of your courage in the process of making us to become our loving Lord stretches us in the area of our weaknesses. Hear me now. The Lord often addresses areas of weaknesses and works out of your weakness and stretches you in the area of your weakness. How? How does he do this? Well, look at Peter, for example. Peter obviously has a serious problem of fear. That's why Jesus is coming into his life to help stretch him from this area of fear. If he's going to become the man of the book of Acts, the fear situation has to be eradicated, yes. has to be dealt with. Yes. He has to transition from a man overwhelmed by fears to a man functioning in faith. Yes. The Lord often, most often, stretches us in the area of our limitation and our weakness. I like to tell people sometimes, don't you think Jesus knew that Matthew, or, or not even Matthew, let me talk about Judas. Don't you think uh, the Lord knew that Judas was a crook, that he was a thief, when he gave him the money box? But what was it about? Not to cause him to fail, but to stretch him in the area of his weakness. God often works in the area of your weakness to make you strong where you were weak. I thought I heard a praise God, but I didn't. God is giving opportunity for you and I to respond in faith. Because faith, faith is risk taking. Yes. It's taking a risk on God. We used to uh, make little acrostics of the word faith. Do you remember? F-A-I-T-H. Faith is forsaking all. I trust him. Amen. Right? In simple terms, that's what faith is. It's, it's forsaking all. I trust him. But then somebody made an acrostic of the word fear. And they put F-E-A-R. And, and fear is false evidence appearing real. Oh yes, think about it. False evidence appearing real. It's the story of the taxi driver. Do you remember the story of the taxi driver? He, it's his first day on the job. And he's so excited. He's got a brand new taxi, first day on the job, and he's, he's driving down the street and somebody waves him down. It's his first passenger. They get in the back, back seat and the man gives him the, the instructions as to where he wants to go. And the taxi driver's smiling. It's his first day on the job, his first customer, and he's driving down the street on a sunny day. And while he's driving, he's sort of daydreaming, enjoying the moment. Uh, the man from the back taps him on the shoulder and he got all nervous. His palms got sweaty. He's, he's, he's swerving with the car, almost hitting some people walking on the side and he, he's shaking and he brings the taxi to a stop and he bows his head on the wheel and he's shaking and he says to the man, I'm sorry, I just got so nervous. So the man says, I didn't think a tap on the shoulder could make anybody get that nervous. Oh, he says, you don't understand. This is my first day on the job. For the past 20 years, I've been driving a hearse. <laughs> False evidence appearing real. Isn't that what often happens to us? God needs to help us to transition yes. from the false evidence which appears real to forsaking all. Yes. I trust Him. Yes. Sometimes we cannot take risks of faith for fear of sinking. 
threatening circumstances can bring us down. And none of us are any different. It's true of all of us. But Micah said something. He prophesied in Micah chapter 2 and verse 13. And talking about the Messiah who would come. Micah prophesied that the Messiah would be someone who breaks open. And in Micah 2.13 he says, The one who breaks open will come. <laughs> Pretend you're with me now. The prophecy is, the one who breaks open will come. Jesus actually came walking into Peter's life as the breaker of fear. Amen. They're overcome. The disciples are overcome. They're panicking. They're full of fear. Peter's overwhelmed by fear. And as the breaker of fear, Jesus said, it is I. Micah says, the one who comes will break open. The one who breaks open will come, and in the midst of that fearful situation, the breaker of fear, Jesus says, it is I. He is there. In your overwhelming circumstances, as the breaker of fear. To me, fear is such a powerful force that it really needs the breaker. It needs to be broken in our lives. Peter, when he looked at the circumstances, thought, I can't do this. He's walking on the water. No, I can't do this. According to his fears, he couldn't. Right? Many advances are not taken. Many projects are not done for fear of failure, for fear of sinking. Come on, let's get rid of some stinking thinking. Let courage rise. Be strong. Be courageous. The breaker has come. The breaker has come. No matter what fearful situation you find yourself in. And some have had fears since they were small girls or small boys. And, and new fears may have even arisen with the circumstances of life. But there is one who says, it is I. Do not be afraid. The breaker has come to your troubled, stormy situation saying, it is I. Do not be afraid. The breaker has come. I can almost stop on that and say, come on, let's have a time of rejoicing here. Don't look like you're looking. Don't look like you've been baptized in pickle juice. Come on. The breaker, the breaker has come. We live in fearful days. Everything around us disciples us in fear. And people talk more about fears, their fears and their faith. But let me tell you, in this time frame in history, it's true. He's come to break up the fear in your life. So once again, we will see the failure of courage in Peter's life. He had a fear of sinking, unlike you. He also had a fear of suffering. If you just flip your Bible from Matthew 14, a couple of pages to Matthew 16, you'll read about Jesus in a place called Caesarea Philippi. You remember this, he asked his disciples, who do men say that I am? And they respond. Some say you're John the Baptist. Some say you're Elijah. Some say you're Jeremiah. Others say you're one of the prophets. So the disciples entered into a discussion in response to this question, who do you say that I am? But Jesus was not looking for a discussion. He was looking for a decision. And so he changes the question and says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, without thinking, blessed Peter, right? Without thinking, he blurts it out. Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus responds to that, doesn't he? He says, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood 
has not revealed it unto you, but my Father which is in heaven. Come on, you can be a flake and still get revelation from the Father. Amen. Ah, that was just a commercial. <laughs> Come on, you can be a wishy-washy person like Peter and still get revelation from the Father. The question today is, do you know who Jesus is? If we ask many people, who do you say that Jesus is? Some would say, oh, he's my strength. Some would say, he's my joy. Others would say, he's my peace. Others would say, he's my way maker. It's true, even though you don't say amen. Others would say, he's my healer. Others would say, he's my deliverer. Others would say, he's my shepherd. And the list can go on and on and on, even though you don't say amen to any of them. He is all those things. But maybe we need to upgrade who Jesus is in our understanding and our thinking today. Yes, he's our healer. Yes, he's our deliverer. Yes, he's our peace. He's our joy. He's our rest. He's our strength. He's our way maker. Yes, he's all those things, but he's more than that. Peter said, you're the Christ. Amen. You're the son of the living God. In other words, if he's just your healer, and healing doesn't come when you name it and claim it, or in the time frame you expect it, then you're discouraged and you're defeated. Yes. If, if he's your provider, and the provision doesn't come in the way you think, or the time you think, then you can get very discouraged because he's just a provider. But if he's the Christ, the Son of the living God, no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what hasn't happened yet, you still know who he is. In, in the midst of my sickness, in the midst of my distress, in the midst of adverse circumstance, I know who Jesus is. Yes, he's the one who, who can make a way in all those circumstances, but he's more than that. He's the Christ. He's the Son of the living God. Praise God. And when those other things haven't happened yet, and you need to understand, just because they haven't happened is no proof that they're not going to happen. Come on now. But you see, if he's just my healer, and healing hasn't happened at this time frame or this stage, then my whole world can cr crush down. But he's more than my healer. He's the Christ. The son of the living God. And regardless of what I'm facing, regardless of what I'm going through, I know who Jesus is. He's the Christ. He's the Christ. He's the Christ. He's the son of the living God. Oh, I'm trying to get amens out of you. You see, this is how I do it. I believe that the gospel needs to be everlasting in order for it to be eternal. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's a joke. But uh, we can shorten the message if you act like you get it. Yes. <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you don't, if it looks like you don't get it, then I have to keep working it. Say, well, I, I'm, not, I'm not communicating well. I'm not doing a good job. I've got to drill deeper here. Yeah. So even if you don't get it, fake it. <laughs> so we can get on. Hello? So here we are, Matthew 14. Jesus, Jesus has just told them that, you know, he's asked them the question, who do you say that I am? Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the son of the living God. And then a few verses down, verse 21, Jesus tells his disciples, he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things and be killed. Now, the reason I, I would say often Peter didn't think because Luke even put it this way. In Luke 9.33, speaking of Peter, it says, not knowing what he said. <laughs> and Peter often didn't know what he was saying. Jesus just said, you know, if you're the Christ, bid me come. Didn't think about this. So the Lord says, come. When he asked him, who do you say that I am? You're the Christ. Doesn't even think. And now here he is. Not thinking again, when the Lord says he must suffer many things and be killed, Peter says, 
No, Lord, be it far from you, Lord. No, Lord, which is a contradiction in itself. Help me now. You cannot say, no, Lord. It's a contradiction. If he's Lord, then there isn't a no there. Come on, it's, you can't say, no, Lord. If he's Lord, come on. Yes. So he's making a contradiction. Be it far from me, Lord. No, Lord. And when he does that, Jesus responds as he did the first time and says, get behind me, Satan. What a picture. First of all, the Lord says to Peter, you have received revelation. You're blessed. Now he says, you're a hindrance to me. Get behind me. You see, Peter needed some stretching in the area of his weakness, which certainly was fear. Not only did he have a fear of sinking, but he had a fear of suffering. I know that's not common here. We're talking about in Mexico. <laughs> Real faith endures. Come on. Real faith does not cave in to the difficulty. When Jesus disclosed that he would suffer and die, Peter couldn't tolerate it. At the same time, Jesus is making a suggestion to Peter and to the others. At the same time, Jesus is saying, if you're afraid of pain, you will never go very far as a disciple. Now it's going to be quiet here. Yeah. Jesus says, follow me. If you follow me, you will learn different levels of pain but the different levels of pain will develop in you uh, and a spirit of endurance, an ability to overcome, an ability to be strong, to be the woman of God, the man of God that he wants to make you to become. So the negative of pain becomes the positive of a product of in your life of a woman of faith and of a man of faith. See, even the pain of self-denial was what they had to embrace. For Jesus says, take up your cross and follow me. The fear of suffering, cross-bearing, has caused many people to fold. Because we live in an era of ease. Take it easy. Take a break. And we, we want to live in an area of ease. But the teacher says, deny yourself. This is a commercial, so take a sleep nap if you want. Just a commercial. The cross principle is simply this. Deny self. Depend on the Savior. And defeat Satan. Amen. End of commercial. Come on. There was a man, maybe you've heard of him, named Augustine. Augustine was a wild womanizer. But Augustine got marvelously converted and began living what we call the crucified life. One day he's walking down the street and one of his many mistresses from the past appeared in the other direction. She didn't know about his conversion, but as she came closer to him, she called to him, Augustine, Augustine. He went on past her, ignoring her. So she called out, Augustine, it is I. And he turned and says, yes, but it is not I. Amen. <laughs> Paul said, I'm crucified with Christ, but it's not I. It's Christ that lives in me. Augustine says, yes, it may be you, but it is not I. Paul says, it's no longer I. I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not I, but Christ who lives in me. Let it be very clear. 
cross-bearing involves denial, pain and suffering. But you see, your faith and my faith will be crippled if we cannot endure. You know, it, you might be sitting there judgment, a little judgmental of me, I don't know. But you know, I know what I'm talking about. Been through my own pain, my own suffering. Some of you know that I, I lost my wife of 50 years. And then I went through the cancer, 60 trips to the cancer center in 100 days. Um, then myalgia, then heart catheterization. Been there, done that, but I'm still here. Amen. I'm still here. Hallelujah. And I'm not stronger or better than anybody else, but it's the grace of God that helps us to rise to new levels that through all these tests and the trials that still burden your heart and, and press in on you, you're able to rise and get up again because we not only believe in the resurrection, come on, we believe in resurrection. A righteous man falls seven times and gets up again and gets up again. So I'm just, I'm trying to encourage you a little bit. You can get up again. Come on. Come on. I know that the fear of suffering is a strong one. It's a powerful one. And so we, we end up with this, with this big C. But the big C is really a little C. Because there's another big C yeah. Yeah. called Christ. Yeah. Right? Yes. Come on now. And, and every once in a while we need to be people of faith and say, well, well the expert says, the doctor says, well, I don't deny that. Faith is not denial. We just, we just want a second opinion, that's all. <laughs> Come on now. Hallelujah. Come on. Amen. Stretching. In the area of suffering. Surely it was very painful for Peter. If Peter could not deny or tolerate what Jesus was saying. And he has to learn here. And we need to learn that we got to rise to new levels of faith. And God is helping us through the weakness, the suffering, the pain, the problem to develop what I call an unstoppable spirit, an ability to endure, to press through. For Peter, difficult circumstances sank him. For Peter, cross-bearing and its pain sank him. We've mentioned the fear of sinking which you can identify with, I know. And for Peter, we've mentioned the fear of suffering. It's a foreign subject. Now the fear of sneering. If you don't like the word sneering, it's just mocking. But you see, I gotta use an S, so it alliterates with my message. In Mark 14, verse 66, Peter, the story is told of Peter. It's a well-known story of Peter's failure of courage, remember? The denial that he was one of Jesus' disciples before a mere serving maid. The fear of being mocked, of being laughed at, can cause courage to wilt. So that's why I'm calling it the fear of sneering or the fear of mocking. Uh, example would be many a soldier in the armed forces have faced shot and shell, but have had no courage uh, to face the sneering or the mocking of their fellow soldiers. Right? Peter could cut off another man's ear, but coward when he heard others accuse him. The fear of the sneer or the fear of mocking has affected many people today. For Peter, the fear factor had to be broken if he's going to become known for his acts. The acts of the apostles could be called the acts of Peter and Paul. Now the fear of the sneer 
sinks him again. You know this, three times down can cause drowning, but for Peter, there was the loving reach of Jesus. I'm not communicating. I've lost this side. <laughs> I'm slowly losing this side. Have I got the center with me? Come on now. Help me. For Peter, it was the loving reach of Jesus. The one who says, it is I. He's sinking in the water, right? And Jesus reached down. And what happened? I don't know about your theology, but I've never, in my mind's eye, seen Jesus and Peter swimming back to the boat. No way! When you reach down, I'm pretty sure they walked back on the water. Come on. The only difference is if it had been me, I wouldn't have got back in the boat right away. I would at least walked around the boat once. <laughs> saying to those guys in the boat, eat your heart out, man. I got some mileage out of this, wouldn't you? But I can see some of the fearful disciples in the boat, especially Peter and Andrew. They were the fearful ones, one nudging the other one. I wish I'd done that. <laughs> Wish God would do that for me. Well, get out of the boat. Yes. Take a step of faith. When he's sinking in the water, it's the loving reach of Jesus that is there. And he walks again on the water. And when, if we want to talk about suffering, Jesus reached again from the cross, exampling that even through the suffering and all that went on, his faith is not weakened. weakened. He's, he's still vibrant. He knows who he is. Father. In other words, I'm your son. You're my father. His faith is unshaken. So he's reaching out from the cross to Peter and the other disciples, exampling that we can endure. We can be more than conquerors through suffering and circumstances. If it comes to sneering, he did it also from the cross because they mocked him and threw his words back in his face. But still he examples to them, Jesus reaches again from the cross and Jesus is always reaching out to us. No matter what the negative situation is, this same Jesus reaches us when we're sinking, when we're suffering, when we're uh, the object of people sneering and mockery, the one who breaks open, the one who says, it is I. The breaker has come yes. to make us to become. Yes. Come on now. The breaker has come to make us to become. I guess you could say in the old terms, from phobia to photostat. Yes. Right? Could you say that? Because as we fast forward into Acts, Acts 4.13, it says, they took knowledge of him, them, that's Peter and John, that they had been with Jesus. When they saw Peter and John, it was a reflection of Jesus. They were just like they had become like him. Look at the change from Matthew to Acts. It's not two Peters, it's one, but it almost seems like two Peters. The change that took place because the fear factor had to be broken in him. It was Augustine who said, it is not I. It was Paul who said, it is not I, but Christ. And Peter's testimony is the same in Acts. Whoever that guy was in the Gospels, it is not I. All because one named Jesus said, it is I. Yes. When the it is I is present in your life, it doesn't have to be you of the past. No matter what the, the crippling situation is. Now, if you preach on fear, it's not an easy task. You even get afraid that it won't be accepted. <laughs> no, you, you get a little intimidated yourself. You say, can I communicate this? Because I think 
Fear is such a powerful weapon of the enemy to bring us down, to shorten our lifespan, to shorten our pro pro productivity, to limit every area of our life, to cripple us, to box us in, to bind us, and to break us down. And it's so, so strong that if you dare to address the subject and preach against it, you can sure that the enemy is not happy about that. Because as long as fear is a factor in your life in any area, you can be controlled. You can be controlled by the enemy of your life. Where you go, what you do, when you do it, how you do it, everything decision of your life is controlled by the spirit of fear. But, but David says, the Lord has delivered me from all of my fears. It seems to me that fear is such a powerful element in all of our lives that it requires a supernatural act yes. for us to be free from fear. David says, I need to be delivered, but the Lord delivered me from all of my fears. If you check out the subject of fear, you will often see the word deliverance in the subject because we need to be free from fear. It's a powerful force. It's limiting who we can be and who we can become and everything about us. I, I, I could be better in every area, more fruitful in every area, if somehow the fear factor can be eliminated from my life. God has not given to us the spirit of fear, but he's given us three for one. Come on. The enemy will give us a spirit of fear, but he's given us a spirit of power, for greater is he that is in us than that which we fear. He's given us a spirit of love, perfect love, cast out all fear. If you're constantly fearful, maybe this is one little word that can help you. You need to fall in love with Jesus all over again. Because when you do, you will not be afraid because perfect love casts out all fear. And he's given us a sound, well-balanced, disciplined mind. People who are fearful are very erratic and impulsive and, and can get in all kinds of trouble. But thank God there's freedom from fear. Come on. Amen. You're supposed to be saying lots of amen so I can park this car. <laughs> so I can bring it to an end. Don't be fearful that this message is going to go on forever. Have, have faith that this message will now come to an end. But it must come to an end this way with something happening. Yes. Hallelujah. I'm not condemning anybody for being fearful. Jesus responds to people in fear. Amen. If you remember Thomas, in the room that was locked and barred, Jesus appeared. Why were they there? For fear of the Jews. And Jesus responded by ministering peace to them. Yes. And, yes. and the Lord, the risen Lord, wants to minister his peace into your spirit, into your life today, Amen. to free you from fear. May it come to the place, like the psalmist, and you will say, I shall not fear. Yes. I shall not fear. Yes. I'm not afraid. Because the breaker has come. Yes. He set me free yes. from all of my fears. He's not only come, but he's with me. Present. Every, every circumstance and situation I find myself, you're the Christ. Amen. You're the Son of the living God. I used to be afraid of this. I used to be nervous in the service about this and nervous in the service about that and fear. I'm afraid. One man says, I, I just, I'm just scared afraid. I think that's pretty, that's pretty scared. <laughs> but that, but may it come to the place where maybe even today somebody could say, oh yes, it is not I. Yes. Well, you used to, you used to, it is not I. God has set me free.
from all of my fears. In Jesus' name, praise God. Can I pray for you? Would you please stand? Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Father, I thank you that you hear our cry. And when your people cry out to you by reason of their affliction or their bondage, deliverance comes. And on the behalf of this group of people, I stand as a priest or I stand as your representative between fear, the expression of fear, and the expression of faith. And I pray in the name of Jesus that the fear factor in the lives of these precious people might be broken in the authority of Jesus' name. May fear be broken because you, the breaker, has come to break open, to release us, to strengthen us in the area of our limitation and our weakness. So Lord, no matter what the fear is, we've made a list of all kinds of fears that people have, but may they not be which mark us. When people think of us, may they think of us in respect of our faith, rather in respect to our fears, because often people say, well, she was, he was, they were, yes, and referring to their fears and the negative aspects of their lives. But today, may we say, it is not I, because the person who used to be that way no longer exists, because we are now a people men and women of faith who trust in you, whose confidence is in you, who are courageous, who are rising to new levels to become salt and light and the men and women of God you've called us to become. Yes, Lord, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You deliver from fear. So may there be a deliverance from fear even now, in the name of Jesus, may fear go in the authority of Jesus' name. And may the peace of God, the peace of God, I minister God's peace to you. Peace. Peace be unto you. May it fill your heart and your soul. And you rest in the peace of God today regarding what you're facing regarding what you're going through, regarding any aspect of your life, I minister peace to you. Let the peace of God come to your life. May you live in His peace, in the strength of God, and not be afraid. In Jesus' name. Lord, I give you the praise. It's for the glory of your name. You can break the fear factor and make us men women of faith, a people that peace flows through and flows to others. Yes. Praise God. Thank you for your peace. Thank you for your peace. Thank you, Thank you for your peace. Yes. Thank you for your peace. Yes. Praise God. You, Praise God. You, Praise God. Yes. Praise God. I didn't hear an amen. If I could hear an amen, I could quit. Amen.